Welcome to God is Open. I'm your host, Christopher Fisher. This is, uh, I guess, our Easter broadcast. Happy Easter. Let's talk about the name of God. Now, this is an interesting subject. I've been researching recently things like the Dead Sea Scrolls and uh, the, the proto Masoretic texts, things like that. And uh, I think the name of God is incredibly important when, when we're going through this. Uh, let's Let's turn to, there's a video by some critics of open theism, and they, I'm going to try to pull it up here real quick, and they just do not like open theism, and they take great issue with me using the term, the name Yahweh. So let's let's see what they have to say about that. Hey Vincent, here with my co-host Sean Cheatham. Uh, you can check us and other podcasts out at reformpodcast.com. Um, also check out our blog at theparticularbaptist.net. And if you're watching on our YouTube channel and you have not yet subscribed to the channel, uh, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell to be right. notified of new videos. Fast forwarding. Change destroys perfection at even one point, And now God has relationships. God is now dependent. God can now change. God can now degrade. God is no longer perfect. And so what they do is they they pull up one of my two minute open theism videos in which I explain the Platonistic concept of God in which God is pure simplicity, and they play the whole video. And so I do got to give these guys credit for that. So I, I got nothing against people who play others in context. Fantastic. To remain perfect, God cannot have parts. God cannot be described. God cannot have relationships. God forever sits alone in a timeless void, indescribable, ineffable, alone. But this is the God of Greek philosophy, not the God of Israelite worship. Yahweh is the God of Israel. He is not alone as he sits with his heavenly council. He is not immutable as he creates, innovates, and learns from the world he created. He changes at every moment of every day. As he grieves over the world, shows mercy to his creation, and forgives. Although he has lived forever, he is not timeless, as he remembers the past and remains hopeful of the future. He watches the world from heaven. He tests the heart of man to learn about them. He eagerly awaits for them to worship him. He is filled with hurt and anger when they reject him. Like a jealous husband, Yahweh becomes emotionally devastated at religious infidelity. Yahweh is betrayed, hurt, laments, becomes vindictive, jaded, spiteful. He judges, he punishes, but ultimately strives for reconciliation. Yahweh is the God of the Bible, not the God of Greek philosophy. Yahweh, the living God. All right, so that's just a little snippet into what open theism is, and you can see that this is from uh, Chris Fisher. Uh, he wrote a book called God is Open, uh, but essentially espousing these uh, doctrines and fleshing them out further. Um, but there are some interesting things that are noted in here. Um, he talks about Greek philosophy and how the God of classical theism is essentially a God of Greek philosophy. And we have heard that essentially somewhere before. And we'll talk about a little bit about that later. Um, but open theism seems to take uh, anthropomorphic, what we would call anthropomorphic language, and says it's univocally being put back to God. That this, when the Bible talks about God repenting or God changing his mind, it really means that God is repenting and God is actually changing his mind like we do, right? There, there's a change going on there. Um, and God, as Sean said, God doesn't know the future. Um, and so his mindset would be similar to ours, right? Learning, gaining knowledge, understanding things as they happen. And notice Chris in here said that God is not timeless, right? He's essentially changing like we are a long time. He's in time like we are. Um, he's not outside of time, transcendent. There, there really is no transcendence. There's only imminence in, uh, in open theism, in imminence in a way that compromises God's eternality as Christians have historically understood. So this is actually pretty interesting. Um, 
their their distinction between transcendence and imminence. I remember the Will Duffy debate about timelessness, and he told the guy, "I think these are categories that you're just making up. There's no like real definitions. These these are these are non concepts." And the guy didn't really have a response for that. And so they they like to make these big distinctions uh, between transcendence and eminence, and have all these definitions. These these are not these are just uh, ad hoc categories. They're just making things up. So Emmanuel asks, where can I get my book? Well, I have it on academia.edu. I will find the link, but let's see what this uh, other guy says real quick. And another thing too, he he calls God Yahweh, um, or you know, if you if you use the KJV rendering Jehovah, but they they're pointing to the same thing that the Tetragrammaton I Am um, from Exodus three fourteen primarily. He's using this concept of uh, God's covenant name, which referring to the I am would refer to God's aseity, his unchangeableness and who he is. God just exists as he is. There's no uh, future. There's no past for God. He just is. <clears throat> no, it's, I... Okay, so look at what he does there. So th this is what I actually found fairly interesting about this video is that they take the I am statement and they have a big paragraph of text describing what that means. That God, there's no future, there's no past, he's pure actuality, pure simplicity. All the Greek attributes that started my video that they first played, they think that I am, that I am, found in Exodus 3.14, is God, Yahweh, saying all of that. Here, here's, here's the thing, where where do they get this from? And uh, let's. I got, uh, I'll pull these guys off and pull up up a Bible, we could look at the context, but it's just not in the context what, what they're getting at. We'll let them talk a little bit more and then we'll cut them off if it's not relevant. I find it kind of ironic that he's using um, that concept uh, to refer to God. But on his website, um, godisopen.com, he gives a, a very concise, but I think very helpful definition of what open theism is. And Okay, so they're, they're done talking about the name of Yahweh, so we'll pull that screen off. But think about that. Where do you get that from? Do you get that from the Bible? Do you get that I am that I am, or I will be who I will be, according to the Hebrew? Do you, do you get that it's it's all the Greek attributes? Outside of time, outside of space, uh, no, no befores, no afters, uh, indescribability, no potentiality. It's, it's just not there. So let's share our screen, and then we will see, we'll take a look at what the Hebrew shows us. And uh, whoa, where, where am I going here? All right. <clears throat> so if we take a look at the actual Hebrew, this is coming from a new translation of Exodus. And there, these are Exodus translation notes on Exodus uh, 314, I will be who I will be. And he talks about the Hebrew grammar and what the proper rendering is. And uh, his case that he builds is not, not that it should be translated, I am that I am, even though people have translated it that, but there's a future element or uh, there, there's a potentiality element. Remember, these guys just told us, the two Calvinists that we're just watching, that the name implied no potentiality, pure actuality, his aseity. God has aseity. He, there's no potentiality in God. But this guy says this, this probably, that there's a good possibility that it's all about potentiality. God's potentiality is built into his name. So I will be who I will be. The most familiar translation of Ahai Asher Ahe is the King James, I am that I am, or in modern English, I am what I am. Other efforts include that LXX, this is Septuagint. Now the Septuagint is a version of the Bible. The Pentateuch was translated in 300 to 200 BC. And this LXX that we have, this translation is likely coming from that translation that was made in Alexandria for Alexandrian uh, Egyptians and Jews to use a Greek version of the Bible. That's where this is coming from. I am the existing one. And this LXX is mirroring the language that you find in Plato when Plato talks about the one. And you see this particularly 
when we look at Philo of Alexandria, he takes this phrase, and here's what he turns this phrase into in the Septuagint. And God said, at first say unto them, I am that I am, that when they have learned that there is no difference between him and that is, and him that it is not, that they may further be taught that there is no name whatsoever that can be properly be assigned to me, who am the only being to whom existence belongs. Pure existence, file of Alexandria. He's reading off of this LXX. So here's what it says. Um, well, I'm going to skip forward in that. Hebrew expresses I am X. However, with a nonverbal sentence, the imperfect of Hawaii always refers to the future. If one could say I am that I am in Hebrew at all, it would probably be thought, it would be probably be through some such barbarous circumlocution as Akui Asher Akui. Likewise, if the meaning were I am Ahe, as the second half of the verse might suggest, we would expect Naki Aher. And if the intention were Aher is who I am, Again, assuming this could be conveyed in Hebrew at all, we should get something like Ehe Asher Anak Hui. So, like the, the 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 literal words that we find in Exodus three fourteen do not translate to "I am that I am." A common common English rendering of it, the, the the construction would be something else if that were in fact the real translation of this phrase. Uh, it, but really, really, um. It is something else entirely different. It is, I will be who I will be. So he says, we still have the option of rendering Ehe, Asher Ehe, as Ehe is who I will be, but this seems like a strange way for the deity to identify himself. Now, there is someone who does make a case that this phrase, Ehe, Asher Ehe, is Yahweh because I am. And when Moses asked the name, you could make, there, there's three three possible possible translations that are, the best translations. Number one is, I will be who I will be. And number two is, I may be who I may be. And then there's an argument made in a book on the, about the names of God that it could be rendered Yahweh because I am. Who are you, God? Well, I'm Yahweh because that's who I am. I'm, I'm Yahweh. So, but I think the best, of course, is this future that's argued also by Rabbi Sachs. He says, we still have the option of rendering it. Yeah, Yahweh is who I will be, but seems like a strange way for the deity to identify himself. So that is an option. I followed, therefore, the translation of Aquila and Theodotion. Now, these are two Greek manuscripts. Now, in the ancient world, you had various Greek competing manuscripts. Remember, the LXX was originally the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible translated into Greek. And then along the way, uh, before Justin Martyr, all these other Greek books were, all these other uh, Hebrew books of the Bible were translated into Greek and added along the way. So that when, by the time we get to Justin Martyr, he seems to be referring to a completed corpus of the Bible in Greek. And that's what they consider the LXX of that time. But uh, there's competing translations. Why? Because the LXX was not a particularly faithful translation of the Hebrew. It's a bad translation. A lot of people love the LXX and they, they think, oh, the LXX is pretty old, so it must be the best. It must be the most faithful. Oh, those Jews just destroy everything. No, the LXX was a translation for philosophical Jews, the first five books of the Bible, and it pulled out, uh, it dehumanized God. It pulled out uh, descriptions of God that made God look like a man. Instead of God being a man of war, God is war-like. And we'll, we'll pull up a very critical book in the development of the LXX and talk about some of these anti-anthropomorphisms, how the LXX dehumanizes God systematically in its pages. It's not a good translation. So the Jews actually started discarding that and Origen writes that they started using Aquila because Aquila was a more faithful translation. A lot of times it left idiom for idiom or or forced new words into Greek where they didn't really have a Greek word for that Hebrew word. And so it is the Aquila, the purpose of the Aquila was to remain faithful to the original uh, proto Masoretic text. And so Theodotion also has that rendering. 
I will be who I will be. And then he, he adds, so this is probably the most probable, I will be who I will be. And then he adds, if the tent is evasion, uh, maybe God's not giving Moses a name. He's saying, Moses asks him for a name. He says, no, nope, I'm not giving you a name. I could be whoever I want to be. I'm whoever I want to be. Go with that. And Moses is just left wanting. So all those are possibilities. So I got uh, Exodus 3.14 pulled up on, here's the Hebrew rendering, but uh, we'll switch to English because English is easier to read. So here, here's the scenario. Uh, God wants a spokesman to go preach on his behalf to Pharaoh to, to rescue the Jews from captivity. This is something that weighs on God's heart. Remember in the previous chapters, God sees their groaning and comes up with a game plan for liberating them. So he needs a spokesman, a vehicle to do this for him. So he calls Moses. He appears to Moses and starts a discussion with him. Moses is like, oh no, who are you? Uh, let's, let's read. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have set, sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. Now, this is the phrase that's in question here. A lot of times this is taken as God's proper name. This is what's read by the Neoplatonists as God stating that he has pure actuality. But what in context is pointing to that? Is, is he's saying, uh, he says, if I go to the people of Israel and, and they say, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And then God's like, well, I'm pure actuality. And time and space don't really apply to me. And um, uh, eternally simple and indescribable. This is, this is in the context of a conversation with God. we got to remember this. And so the context is not, not about that at all. The context is God calling Moses, a call which fails in the next chapters, in which Moses rejects the calling, and God has to send Aaron as the voice instead of Moses. So God's fan, plans fail in context, I don't think this is a metaphysical statement about being. I think uh, much more likely it's God saying, I am whoever I will be, or I can be whoever I want to be because I'm God. And then Moses not having an option. Let's keep reading. And he said this, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh has sent me to you. And so there's some sort of linking between Ahe, Asher, Ahe, and Yahweh that seem to be different forms of the same verb. God also said to Moses, say this unto the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So this is a very personal name. So this name is not only it, let's, let's think if this name is pure actuality, then why is he, adding a bunch of relationships to that name? Why is he linking himself with Israel? If this is a statement about pure actual, pure actuality, no potentiality, simplicity, aseity, those types of concepts. Instead, what makes better sense is I am whoever I want to be, or I am whoever I will be, and I'm with you, Israel. I'm the God of your fathers, and now I'm going to lead you out of Israel. This is actually Rabbi Sachs' take on this, which uh, we could pull up and read it, but uh, I think that fits the context much better. God is a God of potential. God is a dynamic living God, as we see throughout the Bible. So if you just type in living and do a search on living, God is described as living throughout. This is the exact opposite of how people have used this name to Platonize God, to say that uh, he doesn't have change. He's outside of uh, concepts such as potentiality. It, just the exact opposite. He's a dynamic living God, a God of relationships. He says, <laughs> listen to this. And I promise I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt to a land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, Hivites, the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice. And the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to them, 
The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey in the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. The people kind of reject them in the story, too. So it doesn't quite turn out how God expects, but God is talking about future contingencies, future relationships with his people. And so this name is not likely a name about having no potentiality, but a name of infinite potentiality, which can be relationally linked to people to accomplish God's goals. And it's a relational name that they are to know him for forever. So relationality versus impersonality. Relationality makes much more sense. So I'll pull up uh, Rabbi Sachs. I didn't have that pulled up uh, originally because I didn't know if we'd get to Rabbi Sachs. But let's go take a look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because remember, the LXX is a very early translation. So it could be the case, as some people argue, that the LXX is based off of a different Hebrew manuscript than we have available for the proto Masoretic text. Basically, a Hellenized, uh, a Hellenized uh, version of the Bible, because there's various uh, Hebrew manuscripts floating around, a Hellenistic uh, version of the Bible. I got the Rabbi Sachs quote here, but uh, let's, let's flip up. A Hellenistic version of the Bible that the LXX was based off of, which is a possibility. But when we do look at the Dead Sea Scrolls and then we compare them to the LXX, the name of God is not the Platonistic's I am the one, mirroring the God of uh, Plato. Instead, it is this Ehe Asher Ehe. So here's Rabbi Sachs, and he's talking about the differences between Christianity and Judaism. Now, in a perfect world, there would not be differences. We'd be worshiping the same God. We wouldn't have to have these conflicts. The conflicts that we have recorded throughout history, theological debates between Christians and Jews. Rabbi Sachs writes this, the fifth and most profound difference between Christianity and Judaism lies in the way the true traditions understand the key phrase of which God identifies himself to Moses at the burning bush. Who are you? asks Moses. God replies cryptically, Ahe, Asher, Ahe. This was translated into the Greek as ego, ami, ho, on, I am the one. And to Latin as ego, sum, ki, sum, meaning I am who I am, or I am he who is. The early and medieval Christian theologians all understood the phrase to be speaking about ontology, the metaphysical nature of God's existence. It meant that he was being itself, timeless, immutable, incorporeal, understood as the subsisting act of all existing. Augustine defines God as that which does not change and cannot change. Aquinas, continuing the same tradition, reads the Exodus formula as saying that God is true being, that is, being that is eternal, immutable, simple, self-sufficient, and the cause and principle of every creature. But this is the God of Aristotle and the philosophers not the God of Abraham and the prophets. Ahe, Asher, Ahe means none of these things. It means I will be what, where, and how I will be. The essential element of the phrase is the dimension omitted by all early Christian translations, namely the future tense. God is defining himself as the Lord of history, who is about to intervene in an unprecedented way to liberate a group of slaves from the mightiest empire in the ancient world and lead them on a journey towards liberty. So we read the context of Exodus 3. Which, which one of these descriptions of God's name better fits the context? There's nothing in the context about God being timeless. This is, this is one of those times in the Bible where people who want Platonistic notions to be found in the Bible have to just search really diligently to find a little phrase, pull it out of context. There's nothing in context suggesting that this is the meaning of the word. And then they just assign wild leaps of logic on this. Look, look at the formula, that God is eternal, immutable, simple, self-sufficient, and the cause and principle of every creature. That's not what's going on in the text. What's going on in the text is God is recruiting a spokesman to preach his word, to get his message, to do his deeds for a people with whom he's going to be intricately and personally linked throughout the duration of the entire Bible, the entire history. The entire history of Israel's relationship with God 
is being forged in this moment. This is a relational name about future potentialities. That's what's going on here. And we heard our Calvinist friends when we first, first started this. They were taking issue because they heard me using the name of God and they took offense because the name of God means their special, their special uh, things. So let's take a look at, I do got a version of the Dead Sea Scrolls pulled up. In Exodus 3, 14 comes up in various snippets, like uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's not like flowing text without any holes in it. And there's multiple manuscripts and there's partial manuscripts. And so you kind of have to lump them all together or, or translate them all differently. And then there's holes missing. But Exodus 3.14 comes up in several of the manuscripts. And so one of the manuscripts I got pulled up is uh, this one here. It's uh, fragments C and D. And Exodus 3.14, I got to underline. We could take a look at that. And that looks fairly similar, if not exactly the same, as the Hebrew. Ahe, Asher, Ahe. So the earliest Hebrew manuscripts that we have, have I will, who I will be, as God's personal name. That's what Yahweh means. It's his relational name. The Greek, the Septuagint, does something with this. Where are they getting this idea that it's I am the one? Now, I don't take the position that there's any Hebrew manuscripts that ever existed that used that phrase of God, I am the one, which people are going to take in a plainizing sense. And so it, it seems to be one of these things that you see within the LXX where God is depersonalized. Let's pull that off. Let's, uh, I'll, let's go to, uh, I got a book. I bought the book, Anti-Anthropomorphisms in the, in the Septuagint. The Greek Pentateuch is, is what it's called. But it, this is a book that shook up the entire uh, Septuagint scholarly circles in which uh, this book was published and there's a strong pro-reaction and an anti-reaction. I got kind of a history pulled up in one of these documents that we'll read about what happened, how this book affected the scholarly world, what was the pushback, and then some takeaways that what I see and what I see hasn't been responded to and deficiencies I see in the pushbacks. And so this is coming from a paper, you can find this on academia.edu, Anti-Anthropomorphism and the Vorlage of the LXX Exodus. Now, Vorlage is a fancy term for the document for which the LXX is based on. And so this is a a mythical document that we don't have our hands on, but must exist somewhere, probably. Uh, that was there a Hebrew version of the Bible who depersonalized God to the extent that the Septuagint, that LXX, did? That is, that is a good question. All right. The academic treatment of anti, anti-anthropomorphisms in the Septuagint, hereafter the LXX, the LXX is... is uh, Roman numerals for 70, which refers to the myth of the 70 translators who translated the laws of Moses under Ptolemy of Egypt around 200, 300 BC. And so that's why they call it the LX Act. Extends back to the mid 19th century, but first rose to prominence in the middle 20th century with the publication of Charles Fritz Princeton dissertation, which analyzed and classified a wide range of punitive anti anthropomorphisms in the Greek Pentateuch. Now, this is a critical book. You could buy it on Google Books. I bought it on Google Books, and so it's a very good book for understanding the anti-anthropomorphic tendencies within the LXX. So, he says, the following year, Harry Orlinsky vehemently rejected for its presupposition that a translation that removed anthropomorphism evidenced internal and, and <laughs> intentional anti-anthropomorphism. Orlinsky and his students then published a series of articles which confronted the notion of anti-anthropomorphisms in the LXX, Isaiah, Job, and Psalms. Do you, do you already see problems? I see problems there. Because remember, the, the, the actual original uh, Septuagint translated in Egypt was only the first five books of the Bible. 
I'm not seeing any of the first five books of the Bible in that. Isaiah, Job, and Psalms is what they're critiquing. Whereas this book that we're going to pull up is about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, where you probably are going to get the most anti-anthropomorphism. So we're going to look at the two examples we've already talked about. One of those examples is the name of God. And for anyone I've ever dealt with who loves the LXX, who loves the Septuagint, none of them have ever been able to respond to me on that one point of the butchering of God's name in Exodus 3.14. They can't defend it. There's no Hebrew tradition behind it. What's the motivation of the Greek translators for changing it to that? They, they want a myth of an ancient Greek infallible document, much like uh, King James Olnius really want an uh, uh, infallible English translation, but they project it onto the Greek. This Greek translation has to be magical and has to preserve the actual ideas. No, what it is, is it's a Platonistic, it Platonizing tendencies, We'll see that with God's repentances, where if God repents or gets angry within, within the Pentateuch, instead God is just contemplating things or do, doesn't get angry. They, they take out human qualities of God systematically. And this has not been responded to. There's no response. So uh, Orlinsky and his students publish a series of retorts. Nevertheless, as a result of the evidence provided in the textual discoveries in the Judean desert, these polarized camps have given way in recent decades to the more careful text critical methodology. This caution has contributed to contemporary perspective that sees the Septuagint and specifically the Greek Pentateuch as a largely faithful rendering of its vorlage. And so the vorlage would be a, the Hebrew manuscript from which it's translated. There might have been depersonalized versions of the Hebrew floating around from which the LXX was translated. Yes. So we, we got some questions here. Yahweh being a son of El or Yahweh? That, that's a good question. What, what are we dealing with here in Exodus 3.14? And so within Exodus, you do have the passages where El is Elohim is Yahweh. And Mark Smith has a whole whole discussion about this where Exodus really wants to emphasize to Israel that El is Yahweh, that the two shouldn't be conflated as separate deities and are in fact the same deity. And so uh, if, if you read Exodus, there's discussion about how the fathers didn't know, they knew him as El before, they didn't know him as Yahweh. Even though Yahweh's name within the Bible was known prior to Exodus, you have priests of Yahweh, Moses's our father-in-law Jethro was a priest of Yahweh. There are people like uh, Balaam, who was a priest who communicated with Yahweh before Israel arrived in the land. So he was widely worshipped, as records in Genesis. People began calling on the name of the Lord. That Lord there is Yahweh. So Yahweh worship was active and popular. Just Israel always worshipped Yahweh under the name El, and then Moses comes on the scene. And then he has to tell them, El is Yahweh. You've been worshiping him as El. Now you're going to be worshiping him as El, uh, Yahweh. Uh, <laughs> Emmanuel asks, would you say Dr. Heiser would lean towards open theism? It feels like he's a closet open theist. He doesn't want to deal with open theists publicly, probably because they might expose him. He, he, can't, he can't rack up too much heresies. And so PMA Master says, I believe that Heiser holds simple foreknowledge. Yeah, he does. We're, only, we're the only claim in regards to God's foreknowledge, as far as I know, is that God somehow exhaustively foreknows free actions of agents. Yes, that's true. And then he has an entire paper when she tries to claim that uh, the Kayla incident in which God tells what will happen if uh, Saul comes, if the people of the city will turn David over to Saul, he says, yeah, uh, because God knew what would happen in that scenario, that means God knows all possibilities for all time, everywhere. He has a dynamic knowledge, kind of like a Molinistic, Molinistic um, knowledge or neo-Molinistic knowledge, which is interesting. We do have podcasts responding to Heiser on that and a couple podcasts where we talk about Heiser. So according to this paper, the contemporary perspective 
is that the LXX is fairly accurate to its vorlage, the, the Hebrew manuscripts from which it's translated. But I do not think that that is the case in the case of Exodus 3.14. I do not think there ever was a Hebrew manuscript that rendered I am the one rather than I will be who I will be. So I think this is a very good piece of evidence that there is a Platonizing tendency within, within the LXX translation itself. So let's close that. We see already that uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls affirm the original name of God as we have in the Masoretic. And so uh, you would take Dead Sea Scrolls, the Hebrew, over LXX. Hopefully, if you, if you, care, about, if you care about which text is more ancient, you should default to the Dead Sea Scrolls Hebrew. So let's take a look at some other very concerning anti-anthropomorphisms within the Greek Pentateuch. And uh, Genesis 6 is, is one of those instances in which they, they can't have, the, in, in, when you're transitioning from Christianity, or in this case Judaism, to Platonism, a good, good individual to study that type of trans, t- transition would be Philo of Alexandria, who represents a Neoplatonist or Middle Platonist Christian who takes all these verses and says, oh, whoever believes God actually repented, they're the worst people ever. They're, they're awful. He doesn't actually repent. This is just baby language for us. This baby language has been pretty popular in the Neoplatonist type circles. And so what does the LXX do to God's repentance? Oh, so we'll take Genesis 6, 6, and it repented Yehovah, which is what how the, the term that uh, our translator here, our our, uh, our author here, Fritch, he uses Jehovah, and it repented jo- Jehovah. But what does the LXX do? God reflected or was concerned. So instead of being repented, God just thinks about it, which that, that doesn't represent a full transition to Platonism because in Neoplatonism, God cannot have discursive thought because he's pure simplicity. And so it's not a full transition, but it is depersonalizing him, taking out elements which they might find embarrassing God's repentance. You, you'll see that also with his anger. So Genesis uh, 6, 7, it repenteth me. This is God talking. And that's taken by the LXX, for I have become angered. So it, instead of Instead of uh, changing his, his mind on something, it's becoming angry. But you, you get some anger stripping as well within it. So, uh, Exodus uh, thirty-two twelve and repented of the evil. This is in, in reference to the Exodus 32 passage in which God is going to destroy all of Israel. But then Moses intervenes and prays and then God repents of the evil. And this is rendered... And be merciful in regards to the wickedness. Oh, okay. Let's keep going down. Exodus thirty-two fourteen, and Jehovah repented of the evil. It's changed to, and the Lord was moved with compassion. Look at that. Repentance is turned to just a compassionate act. So let's let's keep scrolling. Back to Genesis 6, 6, there's two repentance passages, words, phrases within Genesis 6, 6. And it grieved him at his heart. It's changed to, and he thought it over. God's not going to be grieved. God's not going to be moved with passions. It's, that's an element that needs to be stripped out slowly. So here, here's uh, anti-anger. Uh, Genesis 18, 3. Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. It's changed to... Let be nothing, O Lord, if I speak. See, it, you don't. You, God can't be like stirred to anger through this interaction. You got to strip it out. So you, you see a ton of examples of this happening, and I don't think any of these people who want to de-emphasize the anti-anthropomorphism within the Septuagint have actually dealt with the wide berth of repentance texts being changed. A lot of times they'll go to something trivial or or stuff I, I don't personally care about. But I do care about the name of God and I care about the repentance texts. How is 
systematically changing repentance texts, not Hellenization, not Platonization of the text systematically. Of course, we do have to admit there could be some sort of orillage that has already done this within prior Hebrew manuscripts. We just don't have access to them. And the earliest manuscripts scripts we do have do have Yahweh's original name. So, in short, <laughs> that's a lot of information, but in short, uh, the Calvinists, they don't like that, well, they, they don't know that our, our individuals that we first played, they don't know God's personal name, Yahweh's personal name, as anything but an affirmation of Platonistic values. They see, I will be who I will be, I will be that I will be. And they take it as God's simplicity, pure actuality, timelessness, incompositeness, and, and impassibility, and immutability. But it doesn't mean any of that. There's nothing in context that would suggest that. All of the context points to God's dynamic, rich life in which it's filled with potentiality. It's filled with potential to do things. It's filled with relationships. The whole passage is about God's relationship God's relationship with Israel. And so it makes much more sense, Rabbi Sachs talking about this and criticizing Christians. He's like, what are they doing? They're hijacking our, our, our religion. They're turning it into this Platonistic stuff. This, this is a tradition that's not found in Judaism. And uh, they, they're missing the entire context in which God is personal and relational. We, we know that this is God's original name. Our earliest manuscripts point to this name of God which is properly rendered about his potentiality, I will be who I will be, or I will be whoever I want to be. This is the name of God. So uh, here's PA Master. He says, doesn't God tell someone in Genesis that they would not understand what God's name means? You'd have to pull up a verse for me. But, <laughs> ah, but yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, that when God defines himself, it's in relation to people. And you see that throughout the Bible. God defines himself relationally. Within, within the text of Exodus uh, 3, he says, I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Jacob. And uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I missed Isaac there, but it works. You, you get the idea. He's relational. He defines himself in relation with people. He cares about people. Caring about people is not a Platonistic value. I Getting joy, getting anger, getting pain from outside himself are not Platonistic values. These are the values that need to be stripped from God's name. And where do they get it from? They don't get it from the Bible. Uh, they get it from Neoplatonists. People like Augustine, people like Justin Martyr, people like Philo of Alexandria, reinterpreting God's name because these people need evidences for their preconception about who God is. It's not the God of the Bible, though. It's not what God's name means. God is a relational, dynamic God. So I don't know if I missed anything that I had pulled up that we probably should go over. But, but in short, God's name is personal. God's name is relational. God is a God of people. God cares about people. We're made in God's image. All right, we're going to cut there. Um, if you have any questions or comments, put that down below or start a thread in the God is Open Facebook group. Thank you for listening.